There she is. Well, welcome everyone to the third call in the Freedom Living Summit. I'm having a conversation today with my beautiful, passionate, raw, rich, multifaceted friend, Emily. I'm really, really, really excited for this conversation. I have like little giddy butterflies and my cheeks are already hurting. Emily said that before. <laughs> Sorry, cheeks are already hurting from smiling. It's going to be a great conversation and we're going to cover, well, we're going to wait and see what we cover. There's a lot that we can cover, um, but I'll start by sharing a little bit of how Emily and I met and then I'll ask Emily the first question that everyone has been asked so far, which is what does freedom mean to you? But before we get started, I just want to give everyone a moment on the live and also the replay and also myself and Emily, like all of us a moment to gather our energy, to settle any nerves to drop into the present moment and yeah, to just, even if you're watching the replay and you're not here live, you are bringing energy to this conversation. I mean, you witnessing this conversation, there's something that happens there. So even if you're in the replay and you're cooking or you're driving, whatever's happening, you can still bring your presence into this moment. So it's gonna take oh, a couple of minutes to do that, taking some deep breaths, closing your eyes if you can. Noticing the quality of the breath without needing to change it, just noticing it, allowing it to be. And we're just going to do a little body scan. Start from the top of the head, right at the crown and just begin to melt the awareness like liquid gold. I feel like this is very much the energy I get from you, Emily, influencing this visual liquid gold, this thick, gorgeous, visceral sensation of awareness dripping down over the face, the neck, shoulders, arms, Also, down over the hips, thighs, knees, all the way down the shins, the calf muscles, the ankles, wrapping up the feet between every toe. And just taking a moment to allow yourself to sit in that energy, that golden energy that's holding you. You've created with your own awareness to hold yourself. You're held by yourself. To feel valued in this moment by yourself. Taking a deep breath in through the nose, filling up the chest, the belly, heart. Letting it out. Softening any tension. Any little areas of tension that you can feel in your body. Let them go, let them go, let them go. In your eyes when you feel ready. <laughs> All right, let's get started. So, mm. this is Emily. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm just going to share how we met to kick us off and feel free to chime in at any moment. But man, we were saying before this call, like we had no idea when we first met that we would have the relationship that we have now. It was like, we could have just had those first few interactions and then that was it. And we went on our own separate ways and it's like kind of how our relationship started. That would have been totally appropriate, but instead there's been this resonance and I don't know, like continued, just like continued 
we're still here. We're still here. We're still here. We're still in each other's lives. And also very open-handed. It's felt like our relationship's been incredibly open-handed and it is whatever it needs to be. And it's still here. And we're super grateful for that. So the way that we both met, um, Emily sent an email to join an online women's program. And I was supporting the team with the back end of setting that program up and bringing women in and accepting submissions and applications. And I think it had just closed. We just closed like the, sub the submissions and the course was about to begin. And Emily sent this email, which was like, I think like what, 4 a.m. for you in the morning or something. It was like, Oh, I was not expecting anybody to respond to it for at least 24 hours. I was thinking maybe I'll get it. I didn't even know if I'd get a response. <laughs> yeah. So she sent this email and meanwhile, like I was in Australia. So my time zone was different and it was mid afternoon for me. And I got this email and I knew that we technically closed the applications. And I also knew that the women hosting the program would probably be asleep. And so I was like, this is fine. I'm going to take it upon myself. Yes, Emily, like within minutes, I was like, of course you can join. Here's the link. Just get your sign up done. Like you, you're in, you're in, let's go. So that the other side is that I had to build up a massive amount of courage to even send the email. So I had spent this time being like, should I send it? Should I not? They won't respond. Nah, it's not worth it. I'm late. Ah, fuck it. Up, 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 up. And I get in there and type it. I'm like, all right, it's in the ether now. Whatever's going to happen, happen. And I walked away to do something else. And within like two minutes, it's like, ding, ding. I'm like, what? Came back over and there's this response from you. <laughs> we should go back and look at those emails. I wish I had done that before we called. But anyway, I'll have to do that after. They'll be there. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> so we had that initial interaction. And that was kind of it for a while. And then there was an in-person meetup at the end of that program. And I flew over to the States to be there. Emily flew over from Florida to the West Coast to be there. And I had no idea the impact of that email, by the way. I didn't know the buildup. I didn't know the time of the morning it was. I just responded to the email. That was that. So I was none the wiser. And Emily came up to me in this gorgeous dress tattoos, <laughs> long dark hair. I'm just like, I have chills thinking about it. I'm like, who is this woman? I was so like, I just, I felt your presence and your energy so mm -hmm. viscerally in that moment that like that moment is, I can remember exactly where we were standing, that your eyes and came up to me to share with me the impact that that response to an email had had for you was like, I don't know. It feels like, well, that's why we're still in in sync in each other's lives because the the gratitude of that initial, like seemingly insignificant interaction was felt and appreciated so deeply that it, it almost feels like it cut through like 20 layers of what it takes to build up a friendship and a relationship and just went straight to the like, I really appreciate you and that moment and to for me to feel that and receive that from you and then to feel you and receive you just like boom straight down deep in that level of vulnerability and honesty and rawness and like I crave that connection with people I value that connection and intimacy the depth of that intimacy so much that it's it's now just a given that I adore you and appreciate you in my life and want you in my life and respect your input and respect what you have to say because I can feel you and you've allowed me to feel you so that was that and yeah then we've just like continued to be in each other's lives from a distance we that was the only time we've ever been in person together and that was a year and a half ago and you know we've gone months without having any communication and then we pop back in each other's lives and then we'll weave out again and back in and that's you know it's brilliant not like it's awesome. Brilliant. It's not like we've talked every week since then or anything like that. We just, there's a resonance and a connection there. And yeah, when I was putting together this summit, there there were so many people that I could have conversations with and I didn't, you know, this has shifted and changed so many times, which we can get into the process of that as well. Um, yeah. But what this has ended up being was like, okay, let's do a short 
seven day handful of calls experience to kind of like get the ball rolling and see where this wants to go. And the reason that I wanted Emily to be part of this conversation is because I feel like she embodies freedom. And initially, I, I think like before even starting these conversations, I didn't even really know like why. Why do I feel like Emily embodies freedom? I just do. There's a resonance there. I feel like she embodies freedom. And I, on a personal level, want to hear her talk about her experience and what freedom means to her. And through preparing for these conversations, I am asking Emily more about her story and actually like getting to know you more, Emily. I've gotten a bit more of an understanding of that, but I feel like even today I'm going to get a deeper understanding. And now there's an opportunity to like have an hour and a half conversation and really elaborate on what freedom means to you and how you've, ex what the experience is in your body and the journey of arriving to where you are now and who you are today, which is still on the journey. <laughs> always. And always. So yeah, I feel like that's, that's the introduction complete. So I want to start by asking you the question, what does freedom mean to you? Yeah, thank you. It's a very beautiful introduction. And I just have to throw a little beauty back your way because how do you walk up to somebody that you've never met and you've had one tiny email conversation with and tell them that they changed your life <laughs> because of the response at that time? I mean, it was just such a magical moment. So again, I just want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being there. You didn't even know you were being there in that way, but you were there. <laughs> And thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you've created from that moment forward, because I feel like I have taken part in almost every offering that you've created since we met. And your transmissions and your offerings have also changed my life. So I feel like we were meant to be on this journey together. So I'm just very, very grateful to be here. So <laughs> thank you. So freedom is... Um, well, gosh, we could spend hours talking about it. I definitely had a very different idea of what that word even meant. And I guess the biggest disclaimer I want to start with is when I really think about the word freedom, we are all so free compared to some people in this world. And I think of the wars happening right now and people that are being trafficked and just all those big, gigantic concepts and ideas that I can't even wrap my head around. And I am so free compared to some of these people that are dealing with these things. So when I look at it on that global scale, sometimes it feels hard to have this conversation about what freedom means to me because I've never not been free, right? And when I was in my 20s, I was a really, really, really good drug addict, really good. And to me at that time, freedom was about fuck yeah, I'm doing whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. I do any drug I want. I'm invincible, right? In your 20s, you can party all night, stay up for three days in a row, and there's almost zero consequences other than maybe having to call in sick to work and lie. Like, that was about it. I never got in trouble. I was invincible. And that, to me, at the time, felt like freedom. Fast forward many years, through all the partying and the recreation led to addiction and the addiction led to really difficult, dark times with drugs and alcohol, getting busted. I got busted for stealing medicine for my patients in the hospital and I had to get sober. And then I was faced with the reality that I either got sober or I died and lost my job. Like there were some very real consequences happening. And in getting sober and going to AA and going through the 12 steps, I got to the position of saying, oh my God, that was not freedom. That was a trap. All of that was being trapped. I was trapped. I was stuck with an addiction that was ruling my life. I couldn't not access the drugs. I couldn't not, I was obsessed, right? Like my entire life was ruled by these substances and finding my next fix. And so then to go through all that and get sober and not have this thing that was like latched onto me anymore, that felt like freedom. And I could finally say to myself, oh my God, I don't have this thing. And now I've gone through another level. I feel like I just keep leveling up in my life. So now I've gone through a whole nother transformation, which is that I had developed such a rigid identity around my sobriety. 
the identity of I am Emily and I am a recovered drug addict and alcoholic. I am in AA. I sponsor other women. I have a sponsor, right? This rigid identity around this whole part of me that I refused to look at, accept, or explore other healing modalities that could help me. And I was suffering, suffering so bad from things like the trauma that I never really dealt with, uh, some really difficult sexual stuff with my husband, um, some stuff that I felt I couldn't bring to AA and do anything with the 12 steps. And so freedom to me now means the ability to get out of my own way and give myself permission to kind of try on new things. And so it's it's created a whole new definition of freedom for me, these experiences that I've had. So I cannot give a definition of that word anymore. I feel like it's, I can only tell my stories and my stories equal freedom and liberation and sovereignty and showing up for myself in a way that I have been unable to in the past. And it's just level up, level up, level up, level up. <laughs> and these days we were talking about it before this call. Like I just, is there anything off topic for me these days to have in this conversation? And there really isn't because I have zero shame anymore about the things that I've went through and the things that I've done and the people that I've hurt and how I've hurt myself. Like I'm an open book. It's complete freedom. I don't give a shit what anybody else thinks. This is my story. It's gorgeous. I'm proud of it. I stand in confidence today saying those things. So this is freedom. <laughs> right here, all this. I really appreciate that you have just touched on and like multiple different uh, angles of freedom. Like we contextually and relatively are all incredibly free. Mm -hmm. There's that side of freedom. And then there's the I can do whatever the fuck I want freedom and then there's I'm free within this safe construct that's very contained for you that part of your journey was sobriety I resonate with that through moving through five years of like Christianity and what is the church and I'm gonna fully immerse myself in this container and it like it feels like there's a parallel there and then out the other side of that is like, yes, there is freedom in that, but there is also freedom in being entirely free to explore whatever is resonant in the moment. And now looking back, I can see actually the, the restriction of that context that like at the time felt like freedom because you're contained and you're held. And that I, I guess I'm just trying to articulate, like I appreciate the multiple stages or angles of freedom that you've touched on because it does actually feel like there is freedom in all of that yeah in many ways <laughs> in many ways there are and it's not to invalidate like you're entirely not free if you're within that structure or within that um mindset or way of thinking like no there is freedom in that and at some stages in our journey like we need to appreciate the fact that regardless of our internal stuff going on and the things driving us we are free because we're not living in a war-torn country with bombs dropping on our house or the potential of that there is freedom in that so acknowledging like there's i there is a level of freedom that i'm experiencing and there's more freedom that i can experience but right now like acknowledging i am free in these ways mm -hmm. and this like gradual expansion of okay greater freedom greater freedom greater freedom to the point of surrender it feels like surrender and personal sovereignty and you said before we started the conversation that you were thinking what is really the difference between yeah like what is really the difference between sovereignty and freedom so I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about your journey of personal sovereignty and how that evolution and stage of freedom has looked like in your life and what the experience of that has been and how you've even arrived at being able to really in integrity say like I have personal sovereignty and I have freedom in my personal sovereignty yeah I think it's a it's a process and I 
what feels most alive to bring up right now is the 12 steps that I have worked dozens of times, which truly saved my life, first of all, but also gave me such a great foundation of personal accountability, right? Because you go through these steps and you admit you have a problem. You admit that there's a power greater than you that could restore you to sanity because as a drug addict and alcoholic, you're just completing these insane steps over and over and over again. So you admit there's a power greater than you. You turn your will and your life over to this power and you get to this big fourth step. And the fourth step is the inventory, right? And you take this big inventory of everything that you're pissed about. And it's a great opportunity to put on your whiny panties and just go nuts. Like I'm pissed at this person and this person and this system and this group of people and this institution. And you just go nuts, right? It's very liberating to write out that list. And you, I was always guided to just get into that place where you are a full and on victim mode. And then through the fourth step, once you get done with that, you have to look at your part. And so there's this pivot that occurs in the fourth step where you go from blaming to taking responsibility. And if that is done in a very responsible and accountable way, you then have to look at the areas of your life that these resentments have um, affected. It's affected me financially. It's affected my personal relationships. It's affected my sexual relationship with my husband. It's affected my children. The list goes on and on and on. And so then you get to this place where you're like, holy shit, my resentments and my blaming the world is causing actual issues in my life. And there's no other way to get through this than to take responsibility for what's mine, drop the rest, apologize if I need to, and then get the fuck on with living. And if you're going to do that, then you must be of service because you can't go backwards and just keep thinking about yourself once you've gotten through all that work. So whew, the 12 steps, I feel like every human on the planet should be able to work the 12 steps in some way because it really helps you figure out for yourself how to be accountable. And so that level of accountability has woven through every experience I've had since learning about them. And these days, without really working the 12 steps anymore, because I don't do them much anymore, and I'm not really involved in that program anymore, they still are so valuable to me. And it weaves into every other program I've ever done since then and every container I sit in and every situation that comes up in conflict. And I feel like the difference now is that there was a bit of a, I don't know, it was like a sidestep I took at some point. It was probably after being in AA for a while, relapsing, getting sober again, and revisiting the idea of if I wanted to stay in AA and keep doing the 12 steps and stay on that pathway that I'd already done, or if I wanted to try something new. And in trying some new things, I feel like I've gained access to a different level of accountability when it comes to how I show up in the world, how I speak, the confidence I have behind my words, the apologies that I make, showing up for my kids and being like, guess what? Mama fucked up. <laughs> I fucked up. I showed up. That was really screwed up what I said last night. Like I, I, that is not the kind of parent I want to be. And I'm really sorry. I hope that you'll give me a second chance. Whew. Talk about accountability, freedom, sovereignty. And then my kids are learning those lessons while listening to me say those things. So that kind of stuff was not showing up for me in AA. So because of this new level of liberation and freedom that I've found by trying some new things outside of the 12 steps, it's helped me level up even more. <laughs> what are some of those new things outside of the 12 steps? Yeah. So, you know, um, in, in the program of that I was in and in, in the 12 step programs I was in, it definitely is a big suggestion to meditate and get quiet and listen. And I never took that suggestion. I didn't know how nobody taught me, nobody I never asked either, right? And there's the accountability. I never asked. Um, and so meditation and sitting down and getting quiet. I do a lot of mirror work. I have a giant mirror behind me. You can see it over the last full year and a half of my life. Almost every morning, it's either in front of that mirror or in front of the sun. 
And I sit and I look at myself and I witness, I look at my eyes. I witness myself sitting in meditation. I close my eyes. I open my eyes. I listen to guided meditation sometimes. Sometimes I hum. I just take this time to be with myself and to listen for what else is available. And it gets me out of here and into here. And I feel like the 12 steps, it was a lot of here, even though the work was focused on coming from the heart, I was still thinking and writing and figuring things out. And so I've shifted to these other ways of showing up, which is way more embodied. And to me, it feels way more spiritual and um, quiet. Because if this bitch don't get quiet, I will not hear anything. It's like earmuffs. So that happened. And then um, I have entered, I like to describe that I feel like Lilu from that movie, The Fifth Element, if you've ever seen that movie. It's from, I forget what year it was from. I think it's from the 90s. So some of you might be a little, I'm aging myself here, but it's a fantastic. <laughs> Movie. And at one point, she's she's basically pretty much like an alien that came down to help people learn the truth about existence and life and love and what we're here to really do. It's a great movie. And she's in front of the computer and she's having to download the alphabet to learn about human existence and figure us out so that she can help us. And so she's sitting in front of the computer and she's going through every single letter and she gets through all the whole alphabet and she gets to war and she's just crying. And so I feel have felt like Lilu for the past two years, accessing every single container and offering and gathering that I can afford and fit into parenting and nursing and showing up in the world so that I can learn more, experience more, and access more of what I've already experienced from some of these containers, which is gene keys, <laughs> mm -hmm. sitting in circle with other women, sharing vulnerably about what's going on with us, usually in relation to the gene key keys, and then movement and somatic movement. I started this thing called the ripple effect because I realized in my own work how empowering and beautiful it is to move your fucking body. <laughs> and I did a course with these two women that was so powerful that called Unlock Your Design and they melt the gene keys and human design and astrology together. And they took me through, I can't remember how long it was. It was a very long of uh, course, like six, six months. And one of the first questions they asked to me when I was in this container was, close your eyes. And I want you to describe how they asked me a question, how that feel in your body. And I couldn't answer. Like I had no clue. I had never been asked that before. And I had never been able to access a feeling in my body thinking about it. And so it took six months of going through this course with them of kind of working through that. And they would do these sessions with me over and over again. And I feel like I finally can feel my body now. I feel like I walked around for the first 47 years of my life, a head without a body. And the more I learn now, the more I realize that's probably has to a lot to do with trauma, right? Anybody who's had trauma can understand what I'm talking about. If you've been sexually abused or molested or anything like that, you know what I'm speaking of. There's a lump and nothing happens below the lump. So I feel like by giving myself permission to show up in some of these circles, and saying yes to some of these things that at first sounded taboo to me, that I've been able to feel into that. I know how to answer that question now. And I know what it feels like when I'm sad. I know what it feels like when I'm jealous. I know what it feels like when I feel like I'm being left out. I can feel it in my body now. What a gift. I didn't know that that was a thing, right? <laughs> it almost feels like. I don't know. It feels like there's these different centers of the brain. And I also know that this goes beyond the brain and the head, it's yeah. the brain and the gut and the solar plexus. But it's like, there's these, all these areas that can receive information. And we initially, like I have a similar experience. I did a six week embody, embodiment container called embodied alchemy. And same thing. It was like, all right, through six weeks, a two hour phone call every week, we were guided to, be in a private space put on music there was a little bit of a um like a theme set 
beforehand, some intentions, and then we moved our body to music without mm-hmm. needing it to look a certain way or, you know, be pointing our toes or this or that and like background in dance. Like there was all those things that had to be unlearned and I would catch myself like, no, no, no I'm not doing that. <laughs> no one's watching. I'm not on stage. This is about me feeling my body and moving in whatever way my body wants to move. And my mind now gets to witness my body moving rather than be the one that's at the driving, you know, at the wheel being like, this is how you're going to move now. And then move like this. And maybe if you move like that, it'll move this emotion. Like, no, 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 you can take a rest. My Mm -hmm. body seems to know. Let's like, let it stumble around and figure it out. And it feels like new synaptic connections being made and like pathways happening and points being connected of like, oh, now gosh, I can pick up information from like that part of me and transmit a message here as opposed to it always needing to go ding, 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 ding like this in my brain. And my experience after that six weeks was just like the relief that I felt. I mean, I just it felt like fucking hell. Thank God I don't have to keep doing this in my brain because I was psychoanalyzing everything and getting into every personality test I could and the gene keys and human design and astrology and all of it, amazing tools but like they can also become trappings they can also become limitations that prevent us from actually experiencing freedom and I can choose now when I want to go to the jinkies and have a look at something and I'm curious and I want to expand my understanding or I can literally just contemplate my life's work and the jinkies devotion I can just contemplate with my body not my mind or feel Mm -hmm. like what is the frequency of devotion what is, what's the feeling of it? And how do I feel in my body when it, when I'm in resonance with this energy of devotion or commitment to something like what's happening in my body and like these new connections being made. And it's easy to now talk about like on that side of it. But I also remember initially <laughs> made no fucking sense. It was incredibly frustrating. It was incredibly like painful to realize that I didn't have these connections and that I was so it's just the the feeling in the story at the time was like holy fuck I'm not even story truth of the matter was like I'm so disconnected from my body I yeah. relate heavily to what you said about the lump in the throat and like I can't seem to get past this my breath doesn't get past my neck for a while I remember I had I was experiencing so much pain in my chest and I when I would feel the pain in my chest it's like gosh I need a deeper breath like I feel like I'm not getting enough oxygen in and for weeks I would not be able to breathe past like this constricted part of my chest and that was around the same time that I found the embodiment course and Mm -hmm. as I think back I'm like yeah well that pain in my chest went away and I didn't really notice at the time but now thinking back like I can connect the dots and see how moving my body, allowing myself to be in my body, letting go of what's happening in the mind and witnessing and respecting what's happening in my body has like just this massive knock on effect. So I want to hear from you a little bit more around the ripple effect. Also, like you're, you're a DJ, you're full circle moment of like coming back around to, I guess, utilizing your skill set as a DJ in service to women having an opportunity to feel what's happening in their body with so much fucking joy and celebration and like rocking on behind the, like you just, you know, it's not, your embodiment sessions aren't like, all right, let's feel into the hips. And I don't know, this could be like, and there's a time and place for that. And I will move through some of that as well. It was super supportive. I love, I've only been able to join one because of time zones, but I love the way that you were like, all right, let's fucking go. We're going to party. We're going to feel into our body. We're going to do some deep work here and we're going to have so much fun doing it. Can you talk a little bit about how you came full circle back to doing that? I would love to. It's a great topic. Um, Yeah. So I, you know, I became a DJ from a pretty early age. I started making mixtapes. Again, I'm aging myself for all my friends and, you know, back in the day, you had two mixtapes and you could take one and put a song on the other, but you had to go back and forth. And I was like, man, I wish 
there was a way to melt all of this together. And that was just before I knew that there was such a thing, you know, this was in the nineties. And then I moved, I was in Texas and we went to a rave and I remember walking into this dirty warehouse and watching all these people, hands up. There was a whistle. Everybody was screaming. I was like, what is happening? This is fucking amazing. <laughs> and we walked through the room and I'm like, who is in charge of this shit? Like what is happening here? And I, I remember spinning around and I locked eyes on the DJ who was on just a small elevated stage with the turntables. And when he put his hand up, everybody else put their hand up. When he whistled, they whistled. And I was like, I want to do that immediately like set me on fire. And I spent the next couple of years collecting as much dance music as I could really, really wishing I could learn how to DJ. And then I moved to Colorado, met a guy, he became my boyfriend. He was a DJ. He taught me how to DJ. The rest is history. So I really latched on to that scene because I immediately felt how alive the music was and how genuinely everybody was showing up on the dance floor, just completely saturated in vibe, right? Like it was super, it hooked me right away. There was a lot of drugs, but that was what really, really hooked me. And I spent many years in that scene. I got a little famous. I got to travel around the country and DJing definitely became very performative, and I love performing, fucking love it. I love being on stage. I love dancing. I love watching other people dance. I love knowing that I have something to do with other people having a good time and dancing. And that scene is so heavily saturated in drugs and so heavily saturated in the party that there's so much intoxication. And so my sobriety story happened in the middle of that, in the middle of being a nurse and stealing medications from my patients. And I had to get sober while all of it was going on and everything came to a screeching halt and it became, I either get sober or I die. So I was like, I don't think I'm not going to, I don't think I'll be able to DJ again. How do you do that? How do you get sober and go back to a place like that and be around all that partying without partaking? And I was so connected to all of that with drugs. It just didn't seem possible. But after about a year of sobriety, I got invited to do a radio show called Breaks FM. And I said, yes. And so it was like this, but it was not video. It was just audio. And I got to play to my wall with my vinyl turntables on the radio, on this internet radio show. And it brought back alive all of the same feelings that I had and how much I loved it. And I didn't have to be around it. So I did that and that exploded. And the more I did it, the more I realized I could stay sober and DJ started getting invited to gigs, started playing out again, sober, started bringing circles and groups of sober people with me to the gigs. I had a whole group of deaf kids that would come hear the bass because they couldn't hear, but they could feel. And so I just started realizing that there was more to all this than the party and it's up to me, right? And so this is that level of freedom again. Like it's up to me to create what I want to see in the world. And if I show up sober and I bring this sober crew with me, what if we're inspiring other people who are fucked up to get sober? Because then they go, it is possible. So then it became important, right? And then it became almost I was being of service by showing up as a sober DJ. But there's a saying that runs through the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous in the 12-step programs. And it is... Don't let the life that AA gave you take you away from your AA life. Don't let the life that AA gives you take you away from your AA life. And that's exactly what happened to me. Life got so big and so beautiful and so amazing. And I was famous. I made a music video. I was traveling around the country and I relapsed. I started relapsing. It was I didn't need it anymore, right? I like to say I stopped, I worked the steps backwards and all of a sudden I didn't need the program anymore. I didn't need sobriety anymore. It was good. And shit fell apart. It took a little while for it to fall apart, but it fell apart. And so then I relapsed alone, somewhere in the middle there. I met the new love of my life, had a couple kids, went through postpartum depression. I was still DJing a little bit, but it was nothing like it used to be. And, um, and then the last two or three years of my life is when this transition really happened because I was kind of just saying goodbye to DJing again. There's no way I'll be able to do it. I'm too busy with the kids. I have this whole other life. 
I'm 45 years old. I can't DJ for a room full of 16 year olds anymore. They could be my kids. Like it just was feeling weird. Every time I would say yes to a little gig here and there, it just was not, it didn't feel authentic anymore. And so I start entering all these containers and I start witnessing all of you guys doing these beautiful things to help other women and creating these offerings. And I start saying to myself, shit, I wonder if I could start doing something with music with women to help heal them. And like, well, there's got to be something here. I started researching ecstatic dance, which I'd never heard about. I really don't like the word ecstatic, but that's what it's called. So we're just going to go with that. I would love to call it like transformative dance or transformational dance. Maybe I'll reinvent that. But anyway, I started exploring that. And shortly after I emailed you and got accepted into that women's program, I went to a yoga class. It was a sister circle sound healing yoga class. And at the end of the class, I got the courage up to ask the woman if she would allow me to DJ and bring this dance. And she said, yes. So I did like four classes there. It was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. I had no clue what I was doing. I was very nervous, but I had like 10, 12 women show up every time. And it was magical. But it was so hard to bring all my equipment and do this in person regularly. So then I started the idea of, well, maybe I could do it online. And lo and behold, the ripple effect was born. And it took me three months to come up with that name. And I have to give you credit, Amy, because you and Bernadette started a course called Feel the Frequency, which was a Gene Keys course that helped us go through our activation sequence and because of the embodiment work I had done before and then some inner child work, I worked with some sex coaches to help me get into my body. When I entered that fill the frequency course, I fully, I got the chance to fully embody the gene keys of my activation sequence. And it helped open me up to a, an understanding of the gene keys in a whole new way. And so that ripple effect idea was kind of born from that feel the frequency course a little bit <laughs> because I felt what it would feel like to ripple my energy out by sharing music with other women, by putting this thing out there that I love with all my heart that helps keep me sane and has healed me by dancing and connecting with other women online, like the ripple effect like that would be massive. So that's kind of how this whole thing was born. <laughs> And we'll see where it goes. I remember the after the first one I did, you sent me like a message and you said, I feel like I'm at the beginning of something really exciting and brand new. And I can't wait to see where this goes. Oh, and that meant so much to me that you said that. It really did. <laughs> it's I like every time you do one and share about it, I'm like, damn, it's 2 a.m. in the morning for me. And I'm going to have to stay up one night. I'm going to. Like that, it was just... It was liberating for me to join that first ripple effect hall that you hosted. And to me, it's like an embodiment session. Like it, it, you're you're bringing the music and the ripple of the music, but also your joy and your just your energy, like the vibration and frequency of your energy is rippling out as well as mm. the music. And then it's touching the women who are like. I have goosebumps, like in all over the world, in the most random places, joining and being on this call. And then they're moving their body with their unique frequency. And like, I'm, you know, I'm picturing myself. I was in San Francisco at the time in this living room. I had the laptop set up on a little like ottoman in the living room. I was looking after a dog there at the time. So he was like, oh, what was his name? I forget. It'll come to me. Some cute name big fluffy dog he was hanging around I knew the windows were there there's no curtains like big bay windows in this gorgeous San Francisco house people walking past and I had my headphones in and I was just like dancing and letting loose and it was liberating because like I kind of referenced before like I did the six-week embodiment embodied alchemy journey and I've held some embodiment calls myself and the framework that I was operating in until I joined your call was it was like, honestly, in a way, it feels like almost too intentional. That's what comes up. It's like too intentionally trying to get to something and move it. Yeah. Whereas joining the ripple effect gave me the opportunity to like 
to, to kind of merge that with su surrender, celebration, like we're just gonna dance, we're doing the same thing, like the same thing is happening. And this just another layer for me personally of like, again, you know, it started with like psychoanalyzing. Why is this happening? Why do I have these thought patterns? Why do I have these beliefs? And then, uh, okay, I can move that in my body and I can connect with my emotions without my mind needing to be at the driving, the driver's wheel and I can move through my body and then I can do all of that. And it's all still happening. Like in my living room with <laughs> headphones in and a laptop with a woman who is holding this space with the frequency and the energy that like we are at a women's rave, like a women's sober embodiment rave of a thousand people in a stadium. And like, that's the energy that you're bringing. It's just, ah, oh, I love that's it. The I mean, that's the dream, right? Like that's the vision. The vision is that this turns into a retreat of an entire weekend long retreat of what happens at the ripple effect <laughs> i mean that's the fucking vision lane is gonna be because i'm slowly pulling her into the mix and training her and, uh, you know so like how cool would it be to have a group of women that all can dj and show up on a stage and we have a rotating group of women that is able to just push this out and it's sober it's women it's yeah, yeah it's the vision babe <laughs> you just explained it I love knowing that vision <laughs> and this is the freedom this is the freedom that we're talking about you know I, I sometimes like to say I I have to get out of my own way because I can trap myself I am so capable of trapping myself and I think one of the biggest pivots of my entire life was going from the place of thinking that everybody else was out to get me and the world had fucked me over and you men this and my relative this and all these people that had done me harm. It's all your fucking fault, right? And pivoting that, not to make everything my fault, but to get to that place of, well, what am I responsible for? Well, if I'm responsible for my own happiness and joy, then I am going to create a life that I fucking love, and if I'm not doing that, then what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> right? But you can't get from there to there like that. Like it doesn't happen like that. There has to be all this really in-depth, beautiful work in between here and there. And for me, there's been so many different levels of it. I've had to do a huge deep dive into why I have a hard time being intimate with another human. What is that about? It's really fucking hard for me. And it's because I hated myself. I truly hated who I was. The way that I talked to myself, the things I would tell myself was harsher and more awful than anything anybody else has ever said to me. And so I had to teach myself how to talk to myself kindly with compassion and love and forgiveness. How do you do that, right? And I still don't fully know the answer as to how I've done that other than I have been surrounding myself with people who I feel know how to do that and who are showing me how to do that with grace. And because of some of these things that I've learned how to do by some of you, there's so many women that I could list right now that have helped teach me how to do this. But to sit in front of the mirror, you know, the picture of yourself as a five-year-old and looking at yourself and finding things that are beautiful, a gratitude list. You know, what do you need today, Emily? What is going on with you? You feel frazzled. What can I do to help you? Do you need a hug? Do you need to sing? Do you need to sit with your ukulele half naked in the mirror and try and fucking play it and learn a song and be goofy as fuck? Like, which, which thing do I need today to make it happen? So it is a it is an ongoing journey. And I don't think there's an arrival, you know? I think we're all very clear on that at this point. There's never a point where you're like, I got it. I'm arrived. I'm good. I've mastered myself fully free. Like, I don't know if it's possible, but I work towards it every fucking day. I'll give you a little nugget that was taught to me. Really wise, beautiful man in the rooms in the 12 step program. This guy was 
one of the, they call them old timers, the guys that have been around forever. They've been sober for like 45 years. They can barely even walk into the meeting, but they're at every single meeting and they sit there with their nasty coffee. And, and he said, this is a daily reprieve one day at a time, right? Big messaging in sobriety. And it's like, you have a little satchel and that satchel only exists for 24 hours. And every morning when you wake up, you can fill that satchel with what you need for the day. Are you going to fill it with your phone? Are you going to fill it with the news? Are you going to fill it with gossip? Are you going to fill it with negative thinking? Or are you going to put some prayer, some meditation, naked in front of a mirror, appreciating your body, writing some beautiful things on that mirror, like, I love you. You're beautiful. You have the longest, most beautiful hair, <laughs> like, right? Like, what are you going to put in your little satchel for the day? And then at the end of the day, it's gone. Got to refill it. So this is a daily practice and this is devotion. I am devoted to these practices. They've saved my life. They keep me sane. They help me show up for my family. They help me show up for myself. And in doing that, I get out of myself. <laughs> it's like a paradox. It almost feels like circle talk, talking about it, but. <sighs> I was it's thinking so about that yesterday what you just like the circle thing I was ever a paddle on a I don't know if it's a canoe or a kayak people keep giving me mis mixed messages I was on the lake paddling a little boat and I was <laughs> contemplating the dragonfly which is the in the dream arc connected to the gene keys it's the totem animal or the 55th gene key which we can maybe talk about a little more because it's the gene key for freedom and yeah. you were telling me yesterday that your husband had that as his sq He's like yeah. right at the center the soul the soul essence that we bring in is our sq so anyway the 55th gene key so i was out for paddle a dragonfly had landed on me and i was contemplating the dragonfly and the 55th gene key moves from the shadow of victimhood to the gift of freedom and the city, which is the highest expression of freedom. And it's the only gene key out of the whole 64 gene keys that has the same frequency as the gift and the city. And the dragonfly is a great representation of this energy and frequency of freedom because it goes from being this nymph in the water, like before a dragonfly is a dragonfly, it's, it's still a dragonfly, but it's in the water and it lives in the water and it doesn't have wings and it's living down there and it, that's all it knows. And then all of a sudden it starts to go through this transmutation process and these wings start to form inside of it until they unfurl and come out and the dragonfly pops up out of the water and now it's a dragonfly in the air flying around and it's in this whole new world. And the world of the water is like, that's it. Like it'll never experience being a nymph in the water ever again. It's a, it's got wings and it's in the air. And I was, I was on the water and I was contemplating our current evolution of where we are collectively. And the, the 55th gene key is like a prophecy of our evolution as humanity and a collective right now. And we're moving collectively through this transmutation of moving from victimhood to freedom and it obviously happens at a personal individual level and like we've talked about throughout the entire summit so far it comes down to personal ownership at the end of the day like we are the only ones that can can transmute that energy of victimhood into freedom within ourselves but as we do that there's a ripple effect yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> i was on the water on this let's call it a kayak and i was moving my consciousness between I guess, how do I put this into words? This was all happening in my head. It's the first time I verbally processed. But it was like, I, I remember now with the awareness that I have what it was like to be so deeply enmeshed with my emotions, my experience. I didn't have conscious awareness. I wasn't observing my experience. I was completely in the experience and I was like being in the water the water element is like you you become the water like you are you are the water you are the experience and then there's been a moment 
many it's like a moment that takes time <laughs> so it's not like a moment like that it's like this stretched out time moment where I developed transmuted became aware like I developed the ability to become aware of my experience and now I oscillate between the two all the time like I'm not ever always in the observer observing my experience but nor do I want to be because I also love being the one having the experience and feeling the experience and feeling the emotions and I had a night a few nights ago I found well I had a box of things at my dad's and he was like, can you, you know, it's the last box there. He's like, you've got a box in the shed still. It's like, oh, great. I'll pick it up. I'll take it home. Didn't even think what was in the box. And I opened it up and there was a whole heap of things in there, but something that was in there was a letter from my mum that was super brief. Wasn't like, it wasn't very long, but it captured, it captured this energy and frequency and it opened up like this entire uh like I don't know it feels like this portal wormhole thing I I don't love using all those words I'm like what does that actually mean but it was like this I don't know like I connected to the entire timeline of my relationship with my mom and I sat on the floor absolutely sobbing and just grieving and gratitude and like this massive amount of emotion and while I was experiencing that entirely in the experience, I all of a sudden had this like little moment of awareness where I was witnessing myself in this emotion and it didn't pull me out of the emotion. I was still completely experiencing what I was experiencing and I was observing it at the same time. And this little observer moment that lasted like a second was just like, oh God, I am so fucking proud of you for accessing this amount of emotion and also for the ability to be able to witness yourself in that and not be entirely swept up in the emotion. Like I was still able to witness myself as the version I am now experiencing it without completely identifying with all of the stories and everything. So back to the dragonfly in the water, out of the water, back to this entire conversation and like, what does it even mean to have this personal sovereignty and freedom it feels like what we're evolving, and I don't know, this is just a theory from my time on the lake yesterday, a contemplating the dragonfly. It feels like we're developing the ability to be able to hold all three at the same time, like be entirely in the experience, experience being human, experience the emotion, be in our body, observe the fact that we're a human having a human experience, observe the fact that we are the experience itself, and to have all of that going on at the same time feels like this third dynamic that I don't fully understand and I'm sure we probably will in 500 years time as a collective I don't know but like there's something in that that feels like a popping above the water moment that like you said we're always on the journey yeah. but I it does feel like there's a there is some kind of distinction in that journey and we wonder why we're feeling overwhelmed these days <laughs> No, I love everything that you just described. And I'm really glad that you just started sharing about it because it's something that I, I have wanted to talk about a couple of times in this conversation with you, but then I kind of forgot that I wanted to bring it up. But it's that, that idea of transitioning from not being aware of what you're doing and how you're showing up in the world to being aware and being able to shapeshift yourself in real time while handling what's happening, right? And that is freedom to me. I have had a couple recent conflict like situations where in the past I would have it happen, call everybody a cunt, get on the other side of it and be like, oh shit, that was really bad. Like God, now I got to go and repair and fix everything. And instead of doing that, I've witnessed myself almost as rising above my body, watching myself go through this and been able to talk myself through it, soothe myself, recognize my anger, recognize my frustration and say, Emily, you can, you got this, you got this, show compassion, show love, show up in a professional way, you can handle this. And then I do it and there's no damage control anymore. Whew, talk about. It feels like mature, which is a word I've never used to describe myself. <laughs> uh, 
And it feels like magic almost. It feels like magic to be able to show up for myself and also the other humans I'm in these situations with. I don't have to deal with it like I used to. I don't have to show up in this immature way and call people names and get frustrated and then passive aggressive and then go gossip about it afterwards, right? What a shift. And look at the systems in our world right now, all of this stuff that's crumbling and happening in real time. And we're having to deal with how we feel about all these things. We've got war, we've got the banking system, we've got the educational system, all of these systems that we've been used to that have supposed to have been supporting and helping us are kind of like crumbling and falling apart in real time. Whew. So how do we handle it? How are we going to handle it? How do we navigate that? <laughs> and you're right, like there's, there's a lot happening. No wonder we feel overwhelmed and we don't have to feel overwhelmed. Right. Because kinda, freedom. Because freedom. We kind of need to not feel overwhelmed. Like we kind of need to to find our personal sovereignty and our freedom. There have got to be people who embody that and send out that ripple effect yeah. for us to move through this crumbling. Well, and we get to like, what am I going to choose to take part in right now? Am I going to choose to take part in the gossip and the fear mongering and the political conversations that don't go anywhere and arguing with people online who will never change their mind or agree with the thing that I might be saying? Like, am I going to do that or am I going to be over here in this space where I'm creating love, I'm creating connection, I'm helping women heal and I'm helping women have a safe place to talk about some of these things that are really difficult to talk about without judgment, <laughs> right? Which, where am I going to land? What am yeah. I going to take? Because I want to take part in over here, rippling out in that way, then over here, rippling out in that way. Yeah. Like showing up in these spaces without judgment, but also without needing to change each other, without needing to fix each other, because we respect each other's personal sovereignty. So yeah. I respect the fact that you are exactly where you are and that you have, it is not my job to contort or angle or shift how anyone sees anything or how they show up. It's my job. And I say my job as in like, this is what I've worked out about my unique design and the way that I individually am here to show up, not broadcasting it so everyone else can follow me and show up in this way. No, no, no. It's, this is my way of showing up, is embodying and expressing. Like I'm a Leo son. I'm here to express. I know that about myself. I'm also here to be authentic and I'm here to catch myself when I'm not being authentic and course correct those moments or understand those moments within myself and to embody that journey as an example, as a living example. Not to be like that, but to like to get curious about what is your unique way of showing up? How are you here to show up? And not everyone, like when not, none of us are here to show up in the same way, right. but being in spaces where we can celebrate each other's individual unique expression from a place of sovereignty and personal responsibility and not blaming anyone or anything else, but also it's okay to show, like share the fact that I have been blaming people for my experience. And right now I feel really pissed off X, Y, Z. There's still this kernel. It feels like this kernel inside of like, ultimately I'm still owning my personal experience. I'm still owning the fact that I'm choosing to show up in this space. I'm holding it. I'm not expecting anyone else to take it off me and do something with it. And there is like this, I don't know, in the spaces that you and I have been in together in just this like web of women that we get to be connected to across the world that are in, res there's this resonance of like, we don't need anything from each other. Yes. We love knowing each other. We love getting to witness each other and support each other and learn from each other and show up authentically in our own unique expression and be received and appreciated for that as well. Yes. And we all have our own shit to work on and work through. And we <laughs> all have our own unique, like, high vibe, high expression energy that the world needs. And mine isn't any more valuable than yours. And yours isn't any more valuable than anyone else's. We all have that within us and we all feel like A, have a responsibility 
to do the mirror work, to do the journaling, to to see the reflection of ourselves that is beautiful and needed and valuable and then bring that forward to people who are a safe space to actually be able to receive that and reflect that back to us. Like I see you and I value you and you are safe to show up. Like we had the conversation with Zena, like you're safe to show up as all of you in this yeah. space. And there's an undercurrent of, it's not even, it doesn't feel conditional, but there's this undercurrent of safety and agreement that in doing that, we are still holding ourselves and we are still taking personal responsibility for our experience. We're not expecting anyone else to fix it or change it. And I feel like you, you embody that. You just embody that in a, like such a powerful way because of the depth of life that, and not doing that that you've gone to and experienced and then lifted yourself up out of that place and moved through what you've need to move through in order to land where you are now, which is like, not, you're not walking around with this sign. Like you said, of like sober 12 steps right. doing the thing. It's like, now you're, you're fully expressed in your joy and your, it's like the parts of you that have always been there, the parts of you that are truly Emily, it's like they get full, permission to be there yeah. and to be held and expressed and valued it feels so free it does feel free yeah it really does feel free and it feels really good and there's a a pull to want to share that and express that and bring other people in as much as I can, because if I feel like this, I want everybody else to feel like this. It is intoxicating. And I yeah. love that. <laughs> I love that feeling sober so much. Like I love that feeling, the feeling of being intoxicated with joy and intoxicated with beauty and intoxicated with excitement. Cause I can really fucking feel it now. I can feel it in my body. And I always like to say that I can feel it in every cell of my body. Now that I understand so much more about frequency and sound healing and how we're all vibrating. Like when I feel good, I feel every single cell in my body feels good. And it is magnetic and electric. And I just, what? you know, it's that kind of thing. And when I feel bad, I feel it with every single cell in my body. And I'm finally giving myself permission to feel that stuff now. And that is liberating. That feels like freedom. And I can use my voice now to express what I need to express to my husband. Like I never used to just say what I needed to say. I would just keep my mouth shut because it was easier to stay quiet. And I'm a huge people pleaser and I didn't want it to get into conflict, but I can say the words, I don't want to talk about politics today. No, thank you love you. <laughs> like, you know, and in yeah. being able to just say what I need, that is freedom to just use my voice to say the sentence. I'm actually not interested in that today, but thanks for inviting. <laughs> without, without the charge of like, don't come near me with that. It's like, yeah. th th that doesn't need to be there either because you know that you've got trust yourself. You trust yourself to communicate what you need to remove yourself. If your boundaries aren't respected, Yep, totally. Then and if that can be communicated. Life, guess what? The door is right there. I can just walk out it. I can yeah. shut down media. I can. So, oh, it's really great permission to get to the place. You can say that. Yeah. I haven't asked a question in this, um, like with this framework at all through these conversations, because I've wanted them to be more conversational rather than like directive. However, okay. it feels appropriate to ask the question for people listening to the replay, for the women and whoever, whoever is listening to the replay, this is going to be free and accessible to anyone actually. So I'm not boxing it into women. Whoever is listening to the replay, I would love to hear a little more about like Emily's experience of giving herself that permission as a touch point. I guess I'm like, Zini used this analogy yesterday, like feeling into the future, like with her fingers. And I feel like I'm kind of feeling into the future, connecting with anyone who's watching that may feel like, fuck, I really want to be able to do that. Like, how do I observe my experience? 
how do I, from a grounded place of trusting myself, communicate what I need? How the fuck do I even know what I need? I don't know what I need half the time. That's why I just clench up and panic and freak out and outburst. And I don't know how to shift that. How, like, how did you shift that? What is Emily's personal experience? Maybe like you could take some time to feel into your body to connect with the before and after almost of the felt experience of that and the internal navigation system. And I would love you to just express and share that so that we can receive you in that and also have a bit of a touch point that might support. Mm. Yeah, it's a big full bodied question to answer. And there's a lot of work that's gone into that I said yet, yeah, there's a lot of work that I said yes to that has contributed to what I feel is now my ability to trust myself and to know what to do. <laughs> um, I have the gene key of 57 in my activation sequence. And it is the shadow of unease, the gift of intuition and the city of clarity. I hope I just said that right. I never trusted myself. And I, I like to say these days that part of that came from the 12 step group therapy kind of stuff. I am the problem. I'm a problem. I'm a problem. I'm a problem. And so transitioning from that perspective I took, and I'll take responsibility there. That was a perspective I took, not the one they taught me. But that is the perspective I took is that I am powerless and I do not have power. And shifting into, I do have power. I do have the ability to trust myself. Learning to listen for my voice. What is my voice? How do I tell the difference between the voice that says, get fucked up, go do the drugs, and the voice that says, that's probably not a good idea. So not trusting myself for so many years made it really hard for me to hear the other voice. And the only way I've been able to hear it I believe it's meditation. <laughs> Honestly, that's been the biggest key for me is to learn how to get quiet with myself. And it took a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And I couldn't just get quiet. I don't, I don't even know if that's even possible for anybody to actually get fully quiet. But I needed a lot of guided meditation. I listened to a lot of meditations in my headphones to learn how to still my body, quiet the brain, I read a book called The Untethered Soul. Do you know this book? I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. Great. So that book put words to what I was experiencing in meditation, which was the ability to close my eyes and to listen for my voice and to listen for the chatter that is my brain and to realize that there's a difference and that I can hear and see the chatter as me, who's the real me, and go, that's fucking chatter, Emily. That is chatter, right? <laughs> and I can actually have a conversation with myself and say those words, Emily, you're doing it again. There you go. I'm hearing you do it right now. There it goes. Stop, close your eyes, take a deep breath. Mm, find your voice, listen to your heartbeat, and I connect with myself. So I don't know, man, it feels like such an organic process that I have gone through to get to the place where I can do that with myself. And I am not perfect at it. I am not perfect at it. And I can't do it every time. And there are many times where I have to go backwards and still apologize to people because I flew off the cuff. Whew. It is that it is getting out of my own way. It has been, it has been working with my husband. I honestly believe that that's been a huge component is giving myself permission to be honest and vulnerable with the love of my life, to explain to him why it's hard for me to be intimate and to go through the process of navigating 
difficulty in sexual relations with the person I'm in love with, the person I created children with. That process, it changed my life. It changed our marriage. It changed how we show up for each other. <laughs> it was everything. So I feel like there's something about vulnerability in there. There's something about getting vulnerable enough to admit what it is you're doing and admit the shadow, right? And meet it <laughs> head on and have a conversation with it. I really love that concept of like sitting down and having a conversation with your shadow, sitting down and having a conversation with the part of myself that has a hard time showing up in the bedroom in an intimate situation with another human being. So um, I also did some inner child work. I don't know if you've done that, Amy, but that was Words. a really magical pivot. A really magical pivot. Can I tell that story? Do I have time? Absolutely. To say yeah, please. So I decided to say yes to working with a sex and relationship coach because I was having so so many problems in my marriage, and um, basically to just tell on myself, I faked orgasms with every partner I had ever been with. I never had an orgasm in front of another human. I could get myself off really good, but I could never bring myself to orgasm with another human or, and, or have anybody else touch me and get me there. And I realized this and came out with it while being married after having children in a full-fledged committed relationship with my husband. To talk about a difficult thing to have happen, I had to sit across the bed from him and say, I've been faking orgasms with you for years. That was hard. So I finally say yes to this sex coach because I'm like, that's the problem. The problem is I'm having trouble with intimacy with my partner. And so I sit with this woman and we went through a lot of somatic work together. We did a lot of guided meditation. And finally, one day she's like, if you're open to it, I'd love to guide you through a little inner child work today. I'm like, all right, let's try it. Close eyes. She set the scene and she walked me through. She said, whatever is coming up for you, I want you to feel comfortable just talking about it. I want you to remember the first memory you have. Just, it could be any memory, but the first memory that comes up at, from your childhood and immediately the memory was there and it was a, it's a difficult scene. She had me describe the room, what was on the walls, the bed, the whole scene, what it smelled like, what it looked like, how I was feeling in that moment to connect with my body. How old was I, right? The whole scene. And she didn't really asked me to tell what was happening, but I could imagine what was going on. So in my mind's eye, I was creating this, recreating this scene that occurred to me when I was a little kiddo. And I described it a little bit enough that she understood this was a sexually traumatic situation. And another person walked into this room as a child and was giving me a back rub and then some other inappropriate things happened. And so she asked me in that moment, I want you to imagine somebody coming in the room to save you from this situation. It could be anybody. It could be a family member that you love, someone you really, really trust, a really good friend. And immediately I knew who I was going to choose and it was me. So I chose myself to come into this room and save me from this situation. Should I want you to walk in? I want you to touch this person and gently guide them out of the room. There's no traumatic thing happening. It's not violent. You just guide them out of the room, shut the door. And now it's you and this little girl that's you. And you're going to walk up to her and you're going to sit down with her and you're going to give her a hug and you're going to ask her what she needs. And so she let me there in silence then for the next like couple of minutes. And I just remember rocking and I was holding myself and I was kind of rubbing my hair and I just kept saying, everything is okay, Emily, I got you. It's going to be all right. So that session, oh my God, it was everything. It was so fucking powerful because it felt like the first time I ever showed up for myself. <laughs> and from that moment forward, it was like, I have no choice but to do this from here forward, but to show up for myself. <laughs> there was no other way. So that along with that book, along with meditation and getting quiet were three extremely powerful things that shifted me into being able to hear myself and trust myself. Huge work, difficult work. I mean, fuck. 
not easy to go through and kind of relive that experience, but it was so safe. And she held me so well through that inner child work. And that's the only time I've ever done it. I've just had that one session. It was so powerful. Yeah. And then you learned the skill of how to do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I didn't even know I needed the skill until I got it. Right. Like I didn't know that it was going to be powerful, but that happened. And then shortly before that, which is what prompted me to even work with her was that I had an experience with my husband, you know, he just wants, he wanted to connect with me so deeply. And so every now and then he would roll over and just try and touch me. And, and sometimes I would just do it, even though I didn't want to do it. And it was awful. It was torture. And we had had one of those sessions and I was in the fetal position. I was just in this terrible place. And I remember this voice came into my head and it was like, Emily, I love you. It's okay. And it was the first time I'd ever said that to myself in my head. And it mm. almost surprised that I said it. But I remember saying to myself, you don't have to be awful to yourself because of what just happened. This man loves you. Roll over and talk to him about what's happening to you. And I did. And that was what started the conversation with him about like, I need your help. And I remember saying to him, like, I need your help with this. I need to know that it's safe for me to talk to you about this now, because this is the only way through. Like, we're not going to fix this unless I know deep in my core that it's safe. And he held me, oh, it was a huge transition. That one conversation changed everything. So yeah, is that God? Like, was that a divine intervention? I don't, I'll never know. I love to think of it in that respect, but I also love the idea that like, I finally decided to just show up for myself. Maybe it's the transmutation. Yeah, dragonfly. <laughs> Thank you for being just yeah thanks for your honesty and your vulnerability and also thank you for all the work that you've done in holding yourself to even be able to show up and groundedly honestly share this conversation with us and share your experience because that doesn't just happen mm -hmm. you've done a lot of work to even be able to do that so thank you for all the work that you've put in yeah to be able to share and then thank you for sharing with us because it's I mean fucking hell it's so it's just so fucking relatable that it pains me I relate to that story my own version yeah. it's so relatable and like you said to be in these safe spaces with each other to have these conversations and to just like shed light on the things that we move through Mm -hmm. and move through the layers of shame and guilt and the shitty ways that we talk to ourselves in order to be able to feel safe within ourselves, safe with each other. And like, you know, to have these conversations, like it might not always feel safe or be safe to have the conversation with a partner. Correct. Yeah. But is there a safe space with other women or with a family member? Like, with I mean ultimately it starts within ourselves like you described it's that voice of I love you it's okay like it's okay that that just happened there's um there's that starts there and then holy shit the bravery to then let those words come out of our mouths and to share it with another and to be seen and witnessed that's a massive thing and like there needs to be a foundation of trust in the first place mm -hmm. to be able to take the brave step. I, I'm, I've, I've been really mindful throughout my own journey to not like push myself so far to overwhelm myself or put my body into a state of panic. And I've done that a number of times. And that's been my like kind of back and forth moment of like I want to be vulnerable I want to show up honestly I want to express what's happening inside but the space hasn't necessarily been safe the person receiving it hasn't necessarily been ready again personal responsibility discernment tune in is this relationship a safe space to share this is this person in a place to receive this right now and could I maybe even preface what I'm about to share and ask permission and like get the just give them the heads up like there's I don't know there's a lot of layers to this oh. there's a lot of layers it's yeah it's not easy like you said 
And I don't, I don't think that I really knew how to say the word no <clears throat> up until very recently. <laughs> and part of the process going through this with my husband was learning how to say no to him and not being attached to, but he's my husband. Like I should be having sex with him. I should be making love to him. Right. But like, if I don't want to do it and my body doesn't feel it, then I need to say no, no, I'm not going to do it. And I have learned how to say no really well now with conviction and like no shame behind it. Like I'm not into it. And like what we've discovered, thank the fucking Lord is that I'm like a once a quarter sex kind of bitch. Like that's just my jam. And once a quarter, he gets it. He gets, he gets it, good. it good. I get it good. I, I mean, we have some amazing sexual experiences together now once a quarter. But if I try and do it when I'm not into it, like if I say yes to this thing that I'm not authentically in my body ready to do, I, it will not go well. And that applies to every other thing in my life. If I'm not authentically showing up to a career that I just spent 20 years in, then it's time to make a change. That's what I'm doing. If I can't show up authentically as a DJ on a stage in bunch of a bunch of uh, in front of a bunch of ravers, then it's time to find a new way to access it. Great, let's do fucking ecstatic dance. Are you kidding me? Fuck yes, that is aligned with what I want to be involved in right now. So it's all here for us. It is all here. <laughs> it's like the permission to just to give ourselves the permission to keep growing to keep changing to keep honoring what's true like what is true today I love that I love the story you told earlier about the satchel yes From, yeah like 24 hours every single day we wake up with this new opportunity new like reset gone to sleep we wake up new day sun's coming up like how do we want to show up today and also giving ourselves permission how we show up today can be different to how we've shown up for the last 20 30 That's right years of our lives like it can be different today it also doesn't mean if you put some magic shit in the pouch in the morning your day's gonna go perfect you're gonna have roses right. and organs at the end of the day it's just brilliant that is not what that fucking means it also means that at the end of the day if it was a shit day guess what i'm gonna put myself to bed because i there's nothing else i can do to fix anything that went wrong today i'm just gonna go to bed because i get to wake up in the morning and start all over again <laughs> <sighs> and I were talking about that I think I don't know it, I can't remember if it was before the first call or during the first call so I don't know if it got recorded in the conversation but like sometimes we just need to eat and go to sleep it doesn't need to be as like yes like sometimes there's a time for inner child work there's a time for journaling there's a time for meditating there's a time to take ourselves on a walk outside and I <laughs> like to give ourselves just again the permission and the levity and the humanness of I need to just eat something like I'm a cranky bitch because I'm hungry and I need some sleep and yes there's like a handful of other things that I could be doing but I just got invited to go out for dinner and drinks with friends and I'm gonna get dressed up and go like I did that the other night I was like in a slump of a mood can I lift myself up and like drive 20 minutes and go out for dinner and have a couple of drinks and have some fun with some people I like appreciate their company yes I can do that and I'm gonna do that like this shit can wait for tomorrow there's yep. there is tomorrow and nothing so far up until this point has been this like oh my god I had to have done that yesterday now everything is fucked because I left it the day like nothing that has never happened there is always a solution there's always there's look there's always tomorrow until there's not and so we might as well show up in our full expression today yeah. and put the good shit in the pouch for today. Have a think about how it went. Wake up tomorrow. We get to wake up tomorrow. Fucking amazing. I've got another day to put some new shit in the pouch. <laughs> and continue to express like as authentically and with as much freedom as we have, because ultimately our vibration is rippling out into the world. And like, that's the massive impact. And I think we can, like, it, I feel like it boils down to that, regardless of the job that we're showing up in or the work that we're doing or the relationships that we're in or our service or whatever it is, like, regardless of that, the energy that we show up with, the energy that we put into what we do, the intention behind it, how authentic is it? Like, there's that, I don't know, I've seen that quite a handful of times that 
the vibration of our authenticity, like our aura, is like nine meters with authenticity. And it's like, don't quote me, it's like three or something with happiness and joy. So the, the yeah. idea is when we're really showing up authentically, whatever it is, like there's a there's a strong ripple effect happening there. There's a strong aura, there's a strong energetic field, magnetic field. And that's that's what I I don't know, that's what I want to show up with in the world, authentic as I can. I feel like that's what you're doing. I feel like that's what this whole summit and conversations have been around and also showing and like expressing there's so many different ways to do that. What is yours? What's yeah. your authentic way of doing that? Because it's different oh, to me. Love oh, hearing a people's way of showing up. I love it so much. Yeah. Ah, I love this conversation. Could have it for hours and hours. I know we <laughs> should we should probably wrap it up. Go ahead. It's an hour and a half. Oh, Emily, thank you so much. I love you. I'm so grateful to know you and just get to keep popping in and out of each other's lives. Like just an email, response to an email was that little. So it's like the little, I don't know, the little zappy things coming together. And then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> magic, Amy. You are magic. magic. Thank you for doing this. All right. Thanks for joining. Thanks for saying yes. Yeah. Everything that you've said yes to. <laughs> <laughs> and to close the conversation with the, the theme, the question. Oh, yeah. If you were to... How do I want to put this? I feel like I want to put it a little bit differently every time. If you were to shape shift into an animal right now that is fully experiencing the frequency of freedom, what would that animal be? A fucking dragon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just there. instant. <laughs> Immediately. Why? I am you're the dragon. It's it's been a part of my makeup my whole entire life. And I just when I think of freedom, I think of that bitch on top of a castle, unfurling her wings and taking those steps and just whoosh. And then being able to fly fast all over the world. And then also the responsibility of holding fire. The responsibility of having this gift that, you know, can rain damage on so much and only using it when it really, truly needs to be used. Ah, oh, I love that. I love dragons. <laughs> Sorry, you're right. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, mama. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, let's have, whew. I'm going to need a minute after this conversation. So <laughs> the encouragement, whether it's live or the recording, like we have this transition moment where we finish watching a call like this. We've been immersed in the conversation, feeling it. There's, we've got our own stuff coming up in, you know, the conversation is touching on different things in all of us. Like we all have our own lens and our own experience. So I want to acknowledge that that has been happening for all of us in our own unique way. So when we finish watching this and we close the screen or put the phone down or whatever it is, be super intentional about the next move. What does it need to be for you? I'm going to close my laptop down. I'm going to go grab a drink of water. If the sun is out, I'm going to take my glass of water outside feel the sun on my skin. I know after I've been on calls and looking at a screen for a long time, I noticed this re recently, my tendency is to keep looking on a screen. I feel like there's some kind of like, there's a dopamine hit that's been happening by just looking at a screen. So I'm not gonna do that. And I'm gonna put my bare feet on the earth and just like tune in with myself. What came up even for me personally? Yes, hosting this conversation, contributing to it, but like underneath that, what else was touched on and came up for me and I'm going to give myself some time and space to feel that before anything else and then go from there. So whatever it needs to be for you personally, I encourage you to be intentional about that. And yeah, Emily, thank you so much. Love you, Amy. Thank you. Love you <laughs> right. Thanks everyone for joining live and watching the replay, just bringing your energy to this space and 
bringing your presence and witnessing this conversation. Be great. See you in the next one. One call to go. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, babe. Mm.